Hi, my name is Mike Ward. I'm the Global Director of Content for Informa Pharma Intelligence's uh, Insights uh, Portfolio. Uh, we're here at the Biotech Showcase in San Francisco. Uh, this is a, a meeting where sort of biotech, pharma and uh, investors all get to meet together with other stakeholders to sort of you know, discuss you know, the, the uh, coming year, but also some of the you know, important issues uh, that face the industry. One of those is in fact around the uh, the sort of concept of digital uh, medicine and uh, I'm joined by um, Glenn DeVries who's the president of Medidata Solutions. Yes. You are on one of the uh, the panels today uh, discussing uh, the sort of the challenges of, of digital medicine. Um, so what, what, what was the what was the, the main uh, sort of take home message from from that panel? Yeah, so we were trying to set the stage for a lot of the discussions today um, in, in terms of, of those challenges and really how do we know um, as an industry if we're doing a good job with this idea of digital medicine? So we did a lot to define what digital medicine meant, look at different categories of it. Um, but I really think what things boil down to is um, even just literally from a semantics perspective, digital medicine it ends with the word medicine. Right? And, and so the most important thing is to really anchor the, the discussion and the work, the research in, in digital medicine around what is going to be meaningful patient outcomes. And I'll tell you one of the most uh, interesting things to me that came out of the discussion was because of digital technology, one of the things that's going to change in medicine when, when we stop using the word digital to qualify things yeah. is that we used to have to physically move a patient to be in front of a healthcare provider to, to decide what our opinion is of their health state, right? But now we don't have to move them in front of somebody. We can do something virtually or we can just instrument a person and, and, and watch them and not just watch them in traditional physiological medical sense, but watch their behavior and watch their cognition. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna move from this kind of, this staccato view of a patient's health state to something that's much more based on a continuum of longitudinal objective data, quantitative data, and all these different categories that we can have. So we'll have this really rich view of, of the state of somebody's health, and then really importantly, we'll be able to that much more precisely judge outcomes outcomes for an individual, and that fits into, again, it was a digital medicine discussion, and today's about digital medicine, but it fits into a world of value-based care in a much broader sense in a very important way. Who will be the ultimate arbiter of value? I think these digital technologies will help do that for individual patients. We'll look at quality of life, we'll look at traditional measurements in more sophisticated ways and new measurements. And then we'll be able to really align, whether it's a payer, whether it's a provider, whether it's a pharmaceutical company, we'll be able to align their interests with those of individual patients, not just populations of patients. So, so one can see where, for example, sort of the healthcare industry is, is, is associated with this, where sort of the delivery of medicine, as, as, as you pointed out. But actually some of the, sort of the, the, te the technologies to actually to, to get that delivery are coming from somewhere else. I mean, they are, they are technology and it's technology companies. How, how easy is it to get you know, people who speak, you know, text geek right. with, 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 with uh, you know, bioscience geeks? Right, we need the tech geeks and the bio geeks working together. Yeah. So, so that, uh, that was a, a topic of discussion uh, this morning as well. It, it, I, I look at things, um, because of Medidata's business, we help people run clinical trials. I, I see the world sometimes through life sciences, colored glasses. Um, but I do think if you look at least at the world of pharma, they have both the, the R&D dollar wherewithal as well as the, the ultimate um, patient value and commercial value incentives to, to try to bring some of these digital medicine ideas to fruition. But to your point, they're not companies that are about technology. And so a lot of the things that I think are, are happening in the halls now are people trying to figure out what are the business models by which life sciences companies can partner with a, a startup that's doing digital medicine. Um, how do companies, I, I think, um, I hope Medidata is one of them, how do companies that are in the life sciences technology space now actually make the barriers to those kinds of integrations of technology, business model, and conversations easier to have. And that's going to be a very important thing for kind of delivering the ultimate product of digital medicine. And, and you know, in, and, and the so true definition of disruption where you have uh, something that 
people already know about, but somebody, somebody completely different comes with a, a different approach to do that delivery. Who, who is actually going to, who, who are the vehicles to ensure that digital medicine actually becomes a reality rather than still you know, this, sort of, this concept that we, th we think uh, would, would work? So I, I think with the, with the I, I don't want to use the term hype because I think it's all for good end effect and, and it's, it's really well intended. But I think the inevitability of, of digital solutions for healthcare and medicine, um, it, you can, again, see it walking the halls here. The question is how quickly do we get from the potential to finding the tools that really work? And actually, um, I, I think about it more from the sense that, as I said before, it's just medicine. If you look at life sciences, whether it's a medical device company or a biotech that's making a pill, your job is to make a tool that a healthcare provider can use to help a patient. The tools, right, traditionally are devices and molecules. These digital technologies in some cases are just another class of tool. It's going to be disruptive in that it's a new kind of tool that's distributed another way, but I actually think in a very Congress way, we as an, we've spent 70 years as the life sciences industry trying to figure out how to get good at building tools and figuring out what tools are safe and effective. So actually I think the introduction of them in a, in a discipline regulatory and scientific way can actually be quite seamless. The, the question is how quickly do we get everybody to be able to evaluate them in that context. And, and, and what are the biggest hurdles, what, what do you think is the biggest hurdle? Yeah. It, well in some ways I think uh, some of it's the conversation that you were talking about. We need to get the geeks on the biology side and the tech side being able to talk. I, I think one of the b biggest perceived hurdles might be regulation but I, I don't think that's uh, an actual hurdle. I think um, sometimes pharmaceutical companies can be um, slow to move around technology. Again, uh, Medidata, we, we took us 17 years to get people on the cloud for clinical trials, they got there. Um, I think it's gonna take a while for life sciences companies to wrap their minds around how they can be working with digital medicine companies. But if you look at the potential for, as I said before, um, patient value and economic value, I don't think there will be successful life sciences companies in the future who don't have sensible digital strategies. And I, again, my, my feeling from talking to people and seeing the presentations here today, we're at that kind of tipping point where people are starting to stop thinking about this and, and wanting to dip their toe in the water and realizing that they need substantial digital medicine strategies. So I certainly think that that perception of the industry being slow or not having the right regulatory environment is one that's going to go down just over the course of really 2017. And, and do you see though the possibility that the, the tech businesses actually embrace medicine. So, so rather than sort of pharma companies, you know, embracing sort of technology and, and, and understanding, you know, how they can apply it, that actually we see the tech companies moving into healthcare. I, I think they, I think they can and and they should. Um, understanding how to interact with people and engage them in ways that make them behave differently is something that people think of as a maybe a consumer idea, but it's incredibly applicable to helping people manage their health and, and probably in some cases actually interventional in terms of controlling disease. I think the barrier there is going to be for the technology companies to really learn that discipline and regulation that goes along with the, the in a positive way, the responsibility of being a company that helps people change the way they, they live. Right? Um, so th there's going to be a lot of education in the other direction. E even from a business model perspective, again a topic from this morning, you know, if you look at the price of a pharmaceutical or a medical device, the scientific and regulatory rigor that's required to make that is baked into the price and baked into the business model. And I know there's lots to discuss about pricing of medicines, but let's just pretend magically we're in a value-based care environment. You're still going to bake in that cost. That's not the way people think about digital technologies typically, right? And things are $1.99 in an app store, and for the one that succeeds, it's okay that 100,000 failed. I don't know if we want to have 100,000 different quote unquote cures that don't really work available for $1.99 and you know, iTunes and Google Play. And so I think not only will they need to learn things as, as technology providers, um, but there's probably a lot of room for invention for how that kind of future digital health marketplace will work and still benefit patients maximally. So, did, sort of your finger on the pulse, did, did you get it, um, and you'll, because you'll have participated in some of these panels over, over recent years, yeah. 
Are you optimistic of, of, of the direction and the speed that we're, 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 we're moving on? I am, I am hugely optimistic. Um, uh, I am convinced that the, the, in, the simultaneous um, continuous measurement of traditional physiological elements of the state of all of us, along with cognitive ones, will actually make quality of life a almost m a equally important component of how we evaluate therapies, not just new drugs and devices. And I think that's great for all of us as people and patients. And even if we didn't realize it was from digital technologies, we'll be able to look back a decade from now and say, this is when that quality of life focus came into play. I think it's happening right now, and, and so I think there's just you know, things that would have sounded like science fiction a couple of years ago, you can actually say in these conferences and people go, oh yeah, right, I'm working on that too. Yeah. And, and that to me is hugely encouraging. Right, all right, Glenn, cool. thanks very much for stopping by. Thanks, cheers.